I'm offering five. <laughs> Welcome to Nicholas Grace. Hi. It's Hi. nice to see you. And you too. There is this, I have to say, and I know you must be so bored with people saying it to you, there's this fearsome resemblance between you and Cole Porter. So say, but I can't see it myself. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why people think there's some uncanny resemblance. Do you think that's why you got the part? Is that it? Um, partly. Yeah, partly that. Uh, I've always been interested in Cole Porter since people told me that I look like him. I looked at the photograph of Cole Porter and thought, Surely this isn't me, he doesn't look like me at all. I'm a much better looking person than that. And uh, I looked again and thought, well, the eyes are the same, those awful hangdog eyes and the, uh, the bags underneath. And uh, <laughs> then I thought, yeah, the kind of uh, receding hairline and uh, the pout. And then I started doing quite a lot of research about him. And um, it's about 1982, after Bryce said, someone had said, you look like Cobra. So I started reading up about him then. So it's always been in my mind to have a go at doing a show about him. Brief thumbnail sketch of him as the man. What, what do we know about him? I mean, Well, he was man? a genius. Um, mm. That we goes do. Goes saying, doesn't it? He, uh, very complex guy. I mean, he wrote over 800 songs, which I think is quite phenomenal, more than anyone else. You know, Irving Berlin did pretty well, but he lived to be 101, so it's, it's uh, no surprise. Um, he was, uh, well, he was, he was really a genius from age six. He started playing the violin pretty well at six. Um, he composed his first uh, piano piece, The Bobbling Waltz, which his mother had printed age 10. <laughs> and then he went to Yale, where he actually wrote over 300 songs at Yale. So a lot of his songs are still sung at Yale today, a lot of football songs and uh, sporting songs. Mm. Um, he was part of what they call the East Feats at, at Yale, part of the camp set, if you like, part of the Monty Woolley set. And then uh, in 1919, he met uh, a lady who was described as one of the most beautiful women in the world, Linda Lee Thomas, and they fell in love uh, and they married. Uh, he told he was homosexual. She said, that's fine with me. And uh, she said, the one of the lines in the show is... Blinding uh, sort of very lady, really? Very she was, yeah. <laughs> like you would? Exactly. <laughs> Like she said, uh, he told me he was a practicing homosexual, and I said, practicing? I was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's linked me, actually, to Brideshead Revisited, isn't it, really? Yeah. Odd, odd like that, with that amazing character, Anthony Blanche, who thrust you into the public eye. The most amazing character. Based on someone in real life, funnily enough, who I was reading about last night. Well, two people. Yeah. One was Sir Harold Acton, who's mm -hmm. still with us, uh, and lives in Florence. And the other was Brian Howard. They were both uh, East Eats par excellence, as they were called at Oxford. Fun to do, that Wonderful. Film. One of the happiest jobs I've ever done, Bright said. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely remarkable because, I mean, it, it took nearly two years to film, which was incredible because there was that ITV strike in the middle of it. Um, but it was a wonderful act and a great cast, and uh, none of us had any idea that it was going to be that successful, of course. But for me, it was, it was a great challenge because uh, the character leaps at you from the book. I mean, he's very uh, aggressively decadent in the book. And my, the tightrope that I walked really was trying to be that outrageous and decadent so the audience would feel intimidated slightly but they wouldn't think it was just the actor going over the top which of course it was but, uh, <laughs> I tried to keep it under control this isn't your first musical I mean I remember in the the mid 80s you were doing Coco in the Mikado and you followed that with Sir Joseph Porter yep. in HMS Pinafore are you a, a Gilbertian fan I think I probably am now I certainly wasn't uh, I'm at drama school when I was at the central school the great thing was to to try and do a bit of everything in the late 60s 70s so that uh, we did a lot of music classes as well as all the Shakespearean classical stuff and uh, our final at Central uh, was Guys and Dolls. So I always had a love for musicals. And then there was uh, a ten year gap and then um, I was asked to do Candide for the Edinburgh Festival in 1981. And I played Pangloss and Voltaire in that and then Sadler's Wells Opera asked me to go there and do Coco and the Mikado. And I thought that was the right kind of challenge to take mm -hmm. up. I think that was probably the most frightening first night of my life doing Coco at Sadler's Wells. Why? Because you didn't 
think I'd, you could do it? Or? Yeah, partly because I thought I couldn't do it, and also I had no idea how the audience was going to react. When you go into those patter songs, and you suddenly realize as an actor, if things go wrong, you can improvise and just make it up, and there can be pauses, and you can hope for the best and fill in those gaps. But the music doesn't stop. The orchestra's still playing away when you're in the middle of, um, as someday it may happen that the victim must be found. I've got a little list. I've got a little list of society offenders in my way. And you think, God, what happens if I go wrong? Well, you know what happens if you go wrong is the audience come in with it. Because so right. many of know them know it. Even the gallery know it. Absolutely. <laughs> but it was great. It was, it was wonderful. I loved doing that. And then uh, I was very lucky they asked me back to uh, HMS Pinafore the next year. So mm. I did uh, Coco in the Mikado and Sir Joseph Porter in uh, HMS Pinafore in tandem. Often Gilbert Sullivan is an acquired taste. People either love it or loathe it. With Cole Porter, it strikes me there's a whole new generation discovering these amazing songs. Sure. Are you finding that at the Vaudeville? Yes, absolutely so. I think that's also due to the fact, because it was his 100th anniversary last year, uh, the pop stars brought out an album called Red Hot and Blue, and they did their versions of his songs, and so the younger generation maybe heard for the very first time uh, Cole Porter songs. Mm. But it's not like me. I had no idea in my teens that... Um, Anything Goes was by Cole Porter. In fact, I thought it was by a group called Harper's Bazaar who sang it. I <laughs> thought they'd written it. And uh, it wasn't until a few years later I realized Cole Porter had written it. But I think the young generation now realized just how brilliant his lyrics are. I mean, he covers the whole spectrum. You think of something as delicate as um, every time we say goodbye, I die a little. And going into something like uh, I get a kick out of you or uh, red hot and blue. He was, he was well ahead of his time, which I know sounds a cliche because he's dead now, but he was well ahead of his time because of the syncopation of his music. It's quite extraordinary the way that he was into the jazz rhythm. He broke away from the start of the 20s and 30s at the time. Are you all enjoying the gruelling aspect of, it, of your show? <laughs> it's a pretty hard work. It is pretty hard work. Yeah, I think, uh, I think eight shows a week is too much, really. Um, it's the Wednesday matinee that kills you because, uh, you know, you do the 2.30 show, uh, you finish the drilling, goes down slow, go out for tea, and you come back in at uh, 7 o'clock, get warmed up, and then start again at 8 o'clock and then you're absolutely exhausted, so you have Thursday to recover, Thursday night you're still tired, Friday feeling a bit better unless you come to Pebble Mill. And, and then that finishes you off completely. completely. <laughs> yeah, so I'm dead for tonight. But yeah, it's pretty gruelling. I think we could all get rid of that midweek matinee, and then the Saturday matinee would be chock a block full of people who come to the midweek matinee. Fine. And uh, it would be easier. Seven performances a week would be easier. We'll arrange that for you, Please Nick. do. Make yes. sure you come to the Vaudeville Theatre seven times a week. I'll hear a bit more from you in a moment. For Great. now, Nicholas Grace. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Let's return to the sophistication of the 20s now with an, another slice of this swell party. It's one of Cole Porter's best love songs, sung by Martin Smith, the soft, the gentle, begin... Repeats and repeats in my ear. Don't you know, little sister, you never can win. Use your mentality, wake up to reality. But it's time I do just the thought of you makes me stop before I begin. For I've got. I've got you under my skin. 